Welcome to 24 Hours of Pass, 20 years of pass, past learnings and future vision. We're excited we, you could join us for Paresh Multiwala's session, My Company is Going to Azure, What Can I Do? With this session, we will conclude this 24 Hours of Pass. The sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. You will receive an email letting you know when these are available. My name is Hamish Watson. I'm a data platform MVP and a past summit speaker. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. I have a few introductory slides before I hand over the reins to Paresh. Alrighty. If you require technical assistance, please type your request into the question pane located on the right hand side of your screen and someone will assist you. This question pane is also where you may ask any questions throughout the presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions at any time, and once we get to the Q&A portion of the session, I'll read your questions aloud to the speaker. You're able to zoom in on the presentation content by using the zoom button located on the top of the presentation window. Please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session, which will pop up after the webinar ends in your web browser. Your feedback is really important to us for future events, so please take a moment to complete this. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Microsoft and Intel. The staging of 24 hours of pass would not be possible without their generous support, and they are the reason this event is available free of charge. If you would like to learn more from Microsoft or Intel and sign up for information on how they can help you, please visit the sponsors page of the 24 hours of pass website. Keep learning all year long with PASS. Visit PASS.org and check out all of the free educational resources available to PASS members. Also, don't forget the PASS Summit 2019 will be happening on November 5th in Seattle, Washington. Head over to PASSSummit.com <coughs> and register today. Alrighty. What happened? Okay. Could you go back to your slide? Thank okay. you. Cool. This 24 hours of past session is presented by Paresh Matawala. Paresh is an Azure big data enthusiast, manager of database platform teams, and has led several large SQL implementation, migration, and upgrades. He is an active community member and helps organize, lead, and speak at many SQL Saturdays and pass local and virtual groups. Let's see if there's anything. I think that's it. I think I can take over from here. Okay. Uh, without further ado, here is Parish with <clears throat> my company is going to Azure. What can I do? Over to you, Parish, my friend. Yes. Thank you, Hamish. And uh, you shouldn't be up so late or getting up so early in the morning. <laughs> Uh, they don't know you are from Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm in Boston, and the people around the world, I don't know where they are from, but let's go ahead. So hi, folks. Uh, as Hamish uh, was kind enough to introduce me, I do a lot of work here for the SQL community. In fact, last Saturday, we just finished the uh, Boston BI SQL Saturday. We had over 152 people on the wait list, and it was quite saddening that we were only restricted by the amount of space we had in our venue. <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, my contact information is on the left-hand side. Uh, on LinkedIn, you can find me as Paresh Murivala. Again, on Twitter, as Paresh Murivala. Uh, my Facebook is Paresh Murivala, as you can see that. Uh, yes, I'm not shy about connecting with you on Facebook. Just let me know where you found me. Otherwise, I cannot connect. And my Gmail is paresh.murivala at gmail.com. I also actually take a lot of pride in training junior DBAs, and I also encourage a lot of first-time speakers to get up and speak at our events. And I am a public speaking coach and a debating coach here, and I do that with the children around the globe. So without much ado, let's go ahead and start. That's my family. My daughter just got married. Both of them are doctor. That's my son on the left side. He's like seven feet and 25 inches. And that's some of the students who just finished their course on public speaking about two weeks back. <clears throat> so, today's agenda, who do you think should attend? 
pretty much everyone should attend. A lot of the times it just happens that what I call as an airplane effect. I don't know if my friend Hamish has heard of that airplane effect, but uh, your CIO or COO is actually traveling on a plane to somewhere, some exotic location, and he picks up one of those computer magazines and he zooms in on the word Azure, and the whole company runs after it, and lo and behold, they decide without talking to anybody underneath as to we are going to Azure or cloud in general, right? So, <clears throat> and usually being in the data platform, you are perhaps one of the last people to actually know of this information, and a lot of you might actually identify with that also. So if you care to just kind of say A or yes, if you are one of the people who is brought in very late in the game of such projects, I really appreciate that. If you're still busy, I also understand that, don't worry. So today's agenda, what do we do? What is the first thing we want to do? Assume that you are not just a DBA, but you are a manager of your data platform or you're a manager of IT. And the first thing you want to do is establish a migration architect role. Don't go anywhere without it. And there's a lot more we can talk about it as we go along. I'm just covering the agenda for now. And if I'm speaking too fast or too slow, and if you have any questions, just raise your hands. I would love to answer them as they come up. Choose your level of cloud integration. How much integration do you want to do? Do you want to do all cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever? You need to decide that upfront because quality and decisions ahead of time always save you millions of dollars. What do we want to do? Go a single cloud, multi-cloud. Uh, there's not a single cloud vendor, uh, including Microsoft or AWS or Google, which can guarantee you almost 100% uptime. So just in case something goes wrong, you want to be able to switch over to another vendor. We'll talk about that too. <clears throat> Establish the cloud-based KPIs. And what are the KPIs is the key point indicators. And you really are key performance indicators, and you really want to determine ahead of time and publish the results with your users as to what your findings are. Because guess what's going to happen? The day you go into the cloud, your application has been declared online, what's going to happen? Oh my God, my application is running slow, right? That's the first thing you will hear. Uh, you want to make sure that you have correct statistics to prove that, guys, you are wrong. And then performance baselines. What is the normal? Okay. And during that, we will also determine when do we measure the baselines. We will also cover that as we go along. Uh, prioritize what do you want to migrate first? Do you want to migrate the application? Do you want to migrate the web servers first? Do you want to migrate the database? Uh, do you want to just do everything <clears throat> into one and continue, uh, like all rolled into one, one massive downtime? and do it, it's not as bad as you think, but yes. Perform any necessary refactoring. Now, this is one of the things that I have a serious bone to pick with most management, is they end up doing essentially just lift and shift, basically, so they can check off one checkbox in their resume saying that they help people go into Azure. <clears throat> and without actually having any eye on how this information, I mean, the application will perform and so on, what will be the cost of doing it and so on. And I have some real horror stories and I really want you to be aware of those and not fall into the traps there. Uh, create a data migration plan. This is, I think, by far the biggest concern that you might have is the data migration plan and you really want to work on that because I think the data is by far you would have realized the largest component of what you're doing. So take care of that first and how you want to go about doing it. <clears throat> then comes the time when, okay, you've done everything. There's a time now for switching over the production environment itself, what it takes, uh, who, who does need to be involved, et cetera, we will cover that too. And after you do that, right, or even during the baselines, recording your baselines, you might want to go 
go ahead and see what are the resource allocations that are required and that are actually happening. What is your CPU? Uh, what is your memory consumption? Of course, SQL will consume everything that you have. But a lot of third-party products can actually help you determine this very gracefully too. <clears throat> ah, the word T word, right? The training. Uh, one of the last time your company actually went ahead and provided you with training. So we will cover how to train yourself. Uh, if the company says, oh yeah, we want to go to Azure, we are going to save millions, but we don't have money for training. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to work for that company, but in case you want to survive till you get another job, then this is definitely something you want to cover. I'll be pointing you to various free resources, yes, free. And then of course, there's a lot of marketplace uh, training that is available. And once you've done all this, you really need to start monitoring or you will end up selling your house. So if you do not monitor the cost, then this, uh, the cost just boomerangs big time. And it can be basically what I call as a resume rewriting event. So if you do not monitor that, you're pretty much dead. <clears throat> so let's go. So for the migration architect role, right? That's the first step you want to take. So what are the core responsibilities of that guy or the lady, whoever is there? Um, so let's look at the first one. You have to have a comprehensive planning. <clears throat> there is nothing like, oh, let's first do this and we'll figure out how to do the next move. No, you don't want to do that. So if you're Migration architect gives you an answer which is very iffy. Maybe he's not the right migration architect for you. Refactoring. So <clears throat> a lot of the times you will have noticed that an average age of your servers is about two to three years in your environment. So if you are now going to move these to Azure, please be assured you'll have the latest and the greatest CPU and so on. Uh, so what, what's going to happen is that your application, any inherent weaknesses in your application will stand out very strongly if you do not refactor them. So if it is just going to be lift and shift, prepare it for some nasty surprises. So I've been there, done that, so I'm just letting you know that out of my sheer experience. So. If there are any refactoring steps to be done, the architect can say, okay, for the application, we need to architect A, B, C things. For the databases, we need to do X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Or maybe it's time for you to actually start using the in-memory objects, which you possibly never used. Um, you can start using third-party products for backing up your databases uh, and so on. So you want to work on every single aspect of your application. And most importantly, what are, what is, how is he visualizing? How are you going to move your data, which is actually going to be the key part of it. So mind you, we are not here at a stage where we will actually start doing it, but we want to plan for it ahead of time. Talk to the vendors, see what solutions they have. Microsoft has amazing solution and the ability to actually help you migrate your databases much faster. So definitely, it's a good idea to do that. And once you know this is what you are going to be doing, define the requirements, put it down in pen and paper, go agile, do small chunks of work at a time, two to three weeks deliverable, and the architect will actually tell you in sprint one, in sprint two, in sprint three, what is going to happen, and so on. And then priorities. What do we migrate first, right? Do we want to have our accounting go first or our main product or main application that is giving you a lot of bread and butter? Yes, so you can actually determine the migration priorities. Chances are you will not be involved in this, but if you are, then make sure that you put down everything well. <clears throat> And then when you are actually all done with this setup and how are you going to switch over, you want to plan for that ahead of time, right? 
So, yeah, I kind of like to add a couple of words here and there. Somebody has a question. Okay, so um, more. Harish, um, okay. some. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so I, sorry. my microphone is actually hiding behind my collar sometimes, so that could be the problem. Okay. So bringing it up. So, do you want me to repeat the last couple of points? Let me just go here. Okay, so what we were talking about in general is that you have to determine and select the proper migration architect role, and these are the responsibilities that you want to give that person. Okay, <clears throat> then choose your level of cloud integration, right? So, is it going to be lift and shift? Uh, for those who know, or those who don't know what is lift and shift, is basically you have server one, two, three. You basically take the application, all the bits from server one, two, three, and put it into a cloud, server one, two, three. That's it, you are in the cloud, everybody goes home happy without absolutely any eye to the deal, how it will actually work. So if you are in a tremendous rush because you have to prove something to your stockholders or your upper management that you can do it or not, this is the way to do it. But I can absolutely assure you you will carry with you all the mistakes that you have committed in the on-prem uh, applications. They will not be solved for another 10 years. So your technical debt will keep on rising, whereas you still, you're in the Azure, but you're not, you're not in a situation where you can actually use the best features of it. Deep cloud integration, right? So you want it all in the cloud. Uh, what what part of your things uh, are your applications you want in the cloud? You really want to work on that. Um, ahead of time, uh, your architect should have pointed this out to you. If not, especially with the databases, which we basically represent, this could be a very important part. Auto scaling, right? So if you are going to have a data warehouse in the cloud, right, how are you gonna scale it? Are you gonna scale up? Are you gonna scale out? What are you going to do? So you want to have a cloud warehouse or cloud data warehouse, for example, which can do scaling out, for example, the Azure data warehouse can scale out and can create multiple nodes for you to process your ETL or whatever you are processing in a quick time. Same thing is done by Snowflake DB2. So dynamic load balancing. So if you take auto scaling, that is only for growing and then shrinking back once your work is done. But the dynamic load balancing is basically when one server has too much performance issues or some or too many hits going against it, the topic is automatically balanced. And this is pretty much the same as you have on-prem. It's just that this is in the cloud, but you want to determine that too. Do you want to go for serverless computing, for example? You just want to go ahead and take your exe file and put it in the server so that you don't have to work on the entire application server. This is a tremendous way to save your money. So you have a SQL Server database or the Azure SQL database in the cloud. You have a web server in the cloud, and then you have a serverless component there too. This will actually help you cut down your costs tremendously. So please consider that too. There's like a whole class presented by Microsoft for this serverless computing. So now do we want to select a single cloud or multiple clouds? Right? So if you do that, what does it take? So pardon the lines that have been drawn here, they're kind of weird, but here. So what you could possibly do is one of the ideas is application A in Azure, application B in AWS. That's one idea of doing it. The second idea would be app one in Azure, app two in AWS. This is a significant spread of your risk. But then remember, none of these vendors will actually ever, ever, ever claim that the problem is at their side. So you will end up dealing with five different vendors for this. So be aware of that before you say, yeah, this looks awesome. This is going to protect me tremendously, but I have worked with three or four of these cloud vendors, 
And it gets pretty ugly the moment you step away from Azure. I can promise you that. And then the third one would be, you have application A, B, through all the applications on entirely either Azure or AWS or IBM or Google. Having all of them in one and just as a failover, you might want to have like a Google Cloud or AWS as a backup mechanism for your entire suite of applications. Is my sound coming okay now? I hope so. So let's talk about the KPIs now, right? So this is just some of the samples that we have done in the past. And uh, I can actually send the link uh, of the website from where I got this information. I did not include this. Somehow I forgot my bad. I will share that with you. So user experience, right? That would be the first thing because these are the people who are going to be giving you your paychecks, right? So how much time does it take to load your page? Is there a lag? How much lag is there between two pages? Uh, what is the response time? Uh, in the sense that you click, you fill the form, you click it, how much time does it take for the response to come back? And the session duration, right? I mean, on an average, how long does one user be on a session uh, on the website? In the application and the component performance, for example, you could see what is the level of error rates that are generated, the throughput of the data that is going through. The availability is at 99.9999, or it's four nines, or five nines, or nine nine fives, right? And aptX is the basically the index of the performance of this application in cloud over the performance of this application on prem Then in infrastructure, one of the key uh, stuff that you would want to KPI is the CPU usage, the disk performance, the memory usage, the network throughput, and so on. And in the business engagement, uh, how many cart ads, and what, what is the level of, say for example, in one hour, how many shopping carts were updated or something like that. Uh, what is the percentage of the conversion that happens, okay? Uh, and the engagement rates, both of the business and the uh, website, who is more engaged on this? And you will actually get how much time it takes. Uh, some people I've seen, for example, let me give you this classic example, that you have a report you're running. How many times as a DBA you have seen that somebody clicks that report go the way to coffee because it's on-prem, slow, older machines, and they go back, come back after half an hour and the report is loaded, right? So you want to be sure that the people who do that, how much of the time they are actually on the screen going through this rather than just clicking and going away. So that will really help you to find uh, fine tune your applications too. Then performance baselines, right? This is very crucial for you. And uh, of all the things that I told you, this is the fundamental thing that will buy you a lot of cookies. Okay, give me one second, please. <clears throat> so, in the baselining, you want to say, for my CPU, what is the baseline? This baseline is say 4%, okay? But is it 4% during peak hours or is it 4% during lean hours? You also want to record that information too, because if you're planning for maintenance or anything at all, or if you're planning to add more load to the same infrastructure that you have in Azure, these are the things that will come in very handy for you. For example, if your CPU is consistently at 50%, possibly a bad idea to add anything else on it, right? Unless you know that that whole new application doesn't add more than four or 5% or maybe 10%, you don't want to add a similar application again. So baseline metric for each of the KPIs that we discussed in the previous slide, and go ahead and record it down to the nearest second or milliseconds. Then as I said, the collection times, when did you collect this information, right? You want to record that. and an intelligent BI person can actually help you find out what actually you can do with the data collected and what is the best time to, 
for example, take your backup or re-index your databases and so on. So here's a classic thing that I'm going to just share this with you. Okay. Prioritize the migration components. That would be the next thing that you want to do. Okay. So in the left, uh, that is not my version of Picasso, but what I wanted to show you here is that consider these as the applications in the left-hand corner, for example, and you will realize that as you're trying to move from on-prem to the cloud, you really don't know which application is talking to which application or which server. You really need to go ahead and start nailing that thing. And I call it as a food chain diagram. So you really want to know because if you are going to move one server from the ground into the cloud, guess what's going to happen? Five other things might break. So unless you have that food chain diagram, there are softwares which can actually help you document a lot of your database objects, for example, a lot of it will break. Uh, <clears throat> then let's, the same thing goes on the, so this is the application on the left side, and this is the server level dependencies that you want to make sure that you have documented it just the way I've given it over here, but you can find your own way to go ahead and uh, put it down there. So food chain, top priority, and how do you want to migrate? Do you want to migrate all the application components at the same time? But remember, do you have all the details so that you can fruitfully migrate, right? If not, hold on, there is no rush. Nobody's dying because you're not moving to Azure right away. Food chain, right? We spoke about two of these at the same time. Perform any necessary refactoring, right? So. The idea is you want to do it all at a time. You want to, when I say refactoring means there are, if you do not take into consideration the latest architecture of your hardware in the cloud, then you would have wasted a whole bunch of hours and money on Azure trying to do your application full justice. That is not going to work. So what you can do is, <clears throat> Do not plan for an application so far ahead of the time that you spend six months developing it only to find out that after six months your business needs have changed. So what you want to do is, what is your current requirement? If your requirement is uh, say four CPUs on-prem, that is how it is working that those CPUs may be two to three years old, you're still having those spinning disks at, uh, on the prem. So if you're going to be moving that application to the cloud, what will you do? Uh, will you have the same four CPUs or four cores to go with it? Or what would you do? So my take is that, yes, you might still go with the four cores, but you realize that these cores are going to be much, much faster than the other ones and your Solid state disks in the cloud will also actually help you finish a lot of the work ahead of time. So whatever time factoring that you have done there, the performance factoring you have done there is all wasted. And so you don't want to go ahead and over provision in the cloud because every time your machine is up and running, guess who is paying for it? So instead, I would say, go with what is bare minimum right now. You can always increase it and then if you don't need it, you can actually let it go too. So take the advantage of cloud elasticity, right? Easy migration. So simpler, smaller chunks of movement is much easier to migrate than the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. It is actually going to break your back. Um, you might need more people to actually pull it off and a significantly higher amount of downtime if you're going to be doing this uh, in one giant move. Uh, easy migrations will be like two minutes or five minutes of downtime during Sunday or the mornings that, that basically goes below the radar and your users will be happy that you met with their SLAs. Create a data migration plan. Okay, so if two things, right? Factoring and data migration plan. So how are you going to move your data from the premises to the cloud. 
Uh, anybody wants to chip in with one or two answers, please, if you can make it interactive. I didn't see that. I think maybe Hamish, you can see anybody responding with any answer. Um, yeah, I have yeah. not got anyone responding yet. Okay, cool. I'd love to see somebody um, actually responding to some of these. That would be awesome. So, one of the few things that you can definitely do is bidirectional syncing mechanism, right? So, you can actually have something from the prem talking to your cloud databases in such a way that the day you actually decide to move, all you have to do is make sure that your DNS is in the right place and your application is pointing to the right server, which I'm sure somebody would have scripted it out through PowerShell or something like that, and you're up and running. This actually comes at a significant cost, though, but just take yes, it is available for you to do that. One directional syncing is basically you take a backup or a transaction log, keep on copying it to a blob storage, and by some mechanism there, by an automated log restore script, you can actually go ahead and do that, but your on-prem database will not be aware of what's actually going on in the cloud. Excuse me, Parish, we have yeah. one uh, We have one answer, um, data migration service. Oh, that's exactly correct. So we, that's a very good way to do it. I haven't studied that too much in depth, but that is a good answer to have, and I will actually record that for my purpose too. Thank you, whoever that was. Really appreciate your interaction. And there are third-party products uh, in the cloud that you can definitely exploit to the fullest. A lot of them are either what they call the copy data, or if it is like a multi-terabyte database, what AWS does is that if it is like a petabyte of database, you seriously cannot imagine doing this uh, over. What they do is that they will actually send you a truck whereby you can actually ship your hard drives to them and they will go ahead and upload it onto your server. So the subsequent moves that you have to do is all transactional, maybe differential, or just transaction log backups or restores. So third party products are available, uh, but for very large ones, you might have to consider actually shipping your hard drives to the vendor too, so remember that. <clears throat> Backup, move, restore, so backpack files, classic ways to handle that. Uh, a lot of people feel happy doing it, so do it. Here's a question. If it is a data warehouse, now you have already moved all your OLTP databases to the cloud and you have warehouse on-prem, how would you move that? Special gift for some uh, somebody who answers that. Um, today, you can actually send it to me over email and I will make sure that you have that special gift. So think of that and get back to me, please. Um, switch over production. This is one thing that is a nightmare for a lot of project managers or program managers. So how would you do that? So my take is do it all at once or do it one little chunk at a time. I prefer one little chunk at a time. Uh, you, there are no heroes because if you lose, remember nobody else wins. So take a small chunk at a time, get that credibility. Maybe next time you can do two. Maybe the next time after that you can do three components at a time. But what we have done uh, in our moves is that one of the cloud servers that we freshly created is what I call as a go live environment for those who don't know what it is. is basically your production server acts like a test server till the day of your switch over or cut over. So on the day of your switch over, that production server now becomes a production server rightfully, and you have already vetted it out. The good news is now you don't have to change anything in your firewalls because all the holes are already opened and your servers, the application servers are already pointing to this one. And then what you do is take a copy of this VM that you have in the cloud, and clone it and then make that as a test VM, of course, by renaming it and so on. So make sure uh, the go live environment is a super trick. It has 
worked for me for the past 10 years, and I'm sure it will continue to work for you too. So then, now you are in the cloud. The first month, our bill was multi-million dollars, seriously. And everybody just freaked out, what the hell just happened? Isn't cloud supposed to be cheap? Ah, uh, well, guess what? So there were about 150 people on our team. Everyone started creating seven or eight servers with SSDs and 16 core machines and in multiple geographic locations for disaster recovery and so on. One second, I'm about to talk. So later on, we found out that there is a simple trick then you create a VM where saying that shut it off after 7 p.m. For example, your dev or your QA machines, they don't need to be up all night, right? So what you can do is make sure that they are shut off at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or whatever that user-defined time is. You actually, we have one person. who All that person will do at the end of the week is what is the cost that we are currently facing? Uh, whose machines are up the longest? and then they are spoken to. Otherwise, you will surely face a lot of grief. Okay, so just watch out for that. So monitor, monitor, monitor. So you have done everything so well, but what's the point if your cost is a million dollars, right? It's absolutely pointless to do that. So, okay. So the other considerations for your cloud migration, right? So what is cheap, what is expensive? So what is cheap for us is essentially that it is cheap to get off. I start, click, and you have like 20 servers. Like I was creating a data lake uh, environment for one of our test machine uh, testing batches. And it took me literally five minutes to create 20 VMs. But it was cheap, and we made sure that these machines were shut down between the hours of 12 and 1, when they were actually having lunch, and then again after the training was over at 5 o'clock. That way our costs were kept to a bare minimum. What becomes more expensive is yourself over-provisioning and not shutting off these machines. So over-provisioning would be if you have 16 cores on the prem, please make sure that you don't actually go for 16 cores in the cloud. I can absolutely promise you that will be a total waste of money. <clears throat> So it's cheap first, but expensive later. It's expensive now, but cheap later, right? So you want to watch out for the hidden costs. So chances are that somebody actually triggered one of those marketplace, uh, Azure marketplace purchases and then forgot to turn that off. So it's not just about what you do with the VM servers or the Azure servers itself, but anything that is available in the Azure marketplace, you want to be very sure that you turn it off when it is not necessary. Ah, so the other things, right? Is it a CapEx or an OpEx? So what is a CapEx? Is it a capital expenditure or an operational expenditure? Actually, I would definitely call it as an operational expenditure. The only CapEx that would go for it is the amount of people that are involved in this, but then again, they are already paid by you in terms of salary. These are not specially contracted people. Even if they are, they would still all almost end up being an operational expense. I remember this from about 20, 25 years ago when I used to, actually 25 years ago when I used to sell computers and networking systems in India to my customers. And this should be like about September or October time frame, and somebody says, oh, I need five machines right away, but I don't have money for it, so Paresh, what do you recommend? And I would say, you know what I can do is take these machines, pay me a rental for the next three months, and then after three months, go ahead and issue your purchase order based on your new budget, and you can pay me for that with a little bit of discount because you already paid for three months of rent. Uh, so that is uh, the thing basically exactly uh, what your Azure subscription does for you is that it becomes an operational expense only. Prepare, prepare, prepare. This 
nothing like being over prepared for your Azure, right? This is the fundamental thing you always want to consider. And like any other project in life, right? You have to be prepared with everything that you do. <clears throat> the last thing, just because somebody checked off a checkbox on their resume, it does not mean that they are all done. If you moved it to the cloud, everybody is happy. What is the next thing you do? Reassess six months later because the cloud is changing so fast. Is there something easily available? So one of the things that I did is that we had five data warehouses, each only marginally different. But we basically decided to club all of them into one single data warehouse and move it into cloud. And then they later on said, you know what, screw the data warehouse. We're just going to start using data, where, uh, data lake instead so that we can even start incorporating audio files, x-ray files, and so on. So keep on reassessing and improving. And chances are, and we ask, one of the things you must also watch out for okay, is your licenses. Make sure that your agreement with the customer, I mean, with Microsoft or your cloud vendor, you are on top of those licensing costs. Uh, I can give you a classic example right now. One of the jobs that I was working in, we had an enterprise level agreement with uh, one of the RDBMS providers that should not be named, but it begins with an O. And we had a whole bunch of applications listed and some vagary there saying that, you know, we could possibly add more applications as we go along. So the time came, and again, I'm telling you why you need to be on top of your licensing and improvement is that one of our major applications had to be moved to the cloud. And then we brought this vendor into the picture. They said, oh yeah, you, you owe us $165,000 and then you will pay us $65,000 for data compression. So $225,000 right now, or you will be out of compliance. That is not how it works. And then we had to actually show them our agreement that, well, our license is worded, the enterprise agreement, which is like millions of dollars, it covers everything in the cloud. So, and reassess, is this the right one? Uh, for example, if it is just Azure, is Azure the only solution? Is Google giving you a cheaper deal? Is AWS giving you a cheaper deal? Finally, capitalism comes into picture you may want to go for the best possible vendor, but make sure that you have figures in your hands so that if you have to bargain with Microsoft, you can. Training. This is one of the kind of taboo words, so to speak, in a lot of companies. They don't like to talk about it. One of my previous jobs, the company manager used to say, or my manager used to say, why do you need training? There are YouTube videos. You go ahead and learn from there. I was like, okay, so there was, just saddening, but the most important part is that you know this is not the right place for you to work. So there was a, <clears throat> there was some time back, there was a posting on LinkedIn. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see that, but that the finance manager or the vice president of finance is talking to the CIO and he says, you know, what if I give them the training and they leave the company? The CIO turns around and says, what if we don't give them the training and they stay? So you want to take this as a key dialogue when you're negotiating any training with the company. So, so in training, how many of you are aware of events.microsoft.com? If you haven't done that, please visit this site. There are so many in-person trainings that are happening in metros near you. I'm lucky that I'm in Boston close to New York, Hartford, Albany, where a lot of these sessions are being held. Like for example, the Power BI a dashboard in a day, they are holding it across USA. These are free, they even feed you for the same thing. And the Microsoft pays the vendor who actually does these trainings for you. So then there is Azure Kubernetes services or containers, and then there is something about security in a day and so on, a lot of these eight hour full day trainings, which a lot of the training classes would possibly charge you over 700 or $1,000 a day for these kind of trainings. Please 
check out this website. You will thank me later. <clears throat> the other one. So you remember the Microsoft Virtual Academy? Uh, well, it doesn't exist anymore, so you have to go to this website now. Uh, it's called learn.microsoft.com. You can definitely go ahead and have a lot of those self-paced trainings. They are virtual trainings. And then, of course, there are tons of training providers uh, who actually support PASS and a lot of local chapters. For example, Pragmatic Works has done a lot of job for us. And local colleges, uh, universities actually also have a lot of these trainings for you. More importantly, what I did for my team, and I don't know if you can tell this to your manager or as a manager, you can tell this to your team, is that you take two hours off your company time and you take two hours of your personal time then I will let you take those two hours of the company time and I will not ask you for a status report. As long as you can put in those four hours for studying different things, that will be awesome. It will really enrich our team too. So make sure you take care of that. Training, training, training. Uh, <clears throat> age is not a problem here. You can learn anytime, anywhere. So you can do that within the comforts of your own living room too. So just so you know. And then portal.azure.com, go there, register your email. Azure gives you what, $100 or $200 certificate, uh, I mean credit, and you can actually monkey around with it as much as you want. Make sure that you turn off your resource. I mean, I basically just at the end of my exercises, I just delete my entire resource group so there is no bill. So last two, about three weeks ago, um, I took my AZ100 or the Azure 100 uh, exam for which I had to create a lot of resources, destroy them, create them, destroy them. And I paid a bill of about $13.67. But good news is because I speak at a lot of these Microsoft events, somebody in Microsoft was kind and I get like a $100 a month as a gift subscription. But I have never actually crossed that, which is kind of awesome. So please go to Azure. Uh, don't try to buy books. I'm sorry for all the people who are writing books about Azure. If it is a generic thing, then yes, buy them. But if there are specific things, don't buy books because usually the Azure portal literally changes by the day, by the hour, and sometimes um, in a week too. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so let's see what we spoke about. First thing you want to do is establish the migration architecture. Do not proceed anywhere without this one in place. It could be a program manager who has architectural capabilities. Choose the level of integration you want to have. Okay? Uh, do you want to do all at once? Do you want to have everything in one place? Or do you want to have hybrid? You can determine that yourself. Determine which vendor you want to go or which group. So vendor you want to go. Right? <clears throat> Next, establish what you want to measure to determine the success of your project. So, and then perform the baseline against these KPIs. Prioritize what you want to migrate at a time. <clears throat> perform any necessary refactoring. If it is necessary to rewrite some code, it is better to do it now rather than once it is already in Azure, I tell you it gets more expensive after that. Create a data migration plan. Uh, this is actually going to take the maximum time in terms of switch over. Make sure that you have this nailed down perfectly. Uh, if you have to hire some consultants, feel free to do so. But if you are actually committed to doing everything or moving most of your applications to Azure, Microsoft will provide you with in-house consultants who will actually help you carve out a lot of these paths for your better execution. Then switching over, right? There are two, three ways of doing it. Um, just move everything at the same time, which means you'll have a lot of downtime, have a go-live environment, 
and then take care of the whole life. Uh, one small chunk at a time, it will have the most minimum downtime is by having a live or a go live environment. Review your resource allocation and keep on monitoring that because if you don't monitor it, you will actually go bankrupt. I could even say that. So watch out for that. Provide for training. There are plenty of free trainings available. Really do not necessarily have to pay for this kind of training all the time unless there is a severe scheduling conflict. For example, most of the uh, events.microsoft.com that I spoke to you about, they are actually held during the weekdays, which means that some of your guys will have to take the time off during the weekdays to attend those. But hey, wait, it's free. If they're not doing it, most of the companies do not actually provide weekend training. So you'll have to end up buying on-demand training from other companies. Uh, go do SQL Saturdays, go to the Azure data fest that Microsoft actually hosts. The Global Azure Bootcamp is coming up on 27th April. So you will have an Azure workshop, one free, full free day of Azure workshop in the metros near you. For example, actually in Boston, we have two of those. One is in MIT and the other one is in the Microsoft office. I am lucky I'll be speaking at those events too. So consider those things. Yeah, I should actually add these uh, things in my training, and I will take care of it for the next time. Monitor always uh, not pretty without monitoring it. I can tell you that. So questions. We have about eight minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to share them. If you want to actually go ahead and share some of your stories, then Hamish is waiting for that. Hamish. Thing, feel free to share that. Fantastic. Thank you, Parish, and thank you for your session. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, is there a pre-configured VM for SSRS when moving all your data to Azure SQL? Since you're already paying for Azure SQL and SSRS as part of the SQL license, should you have to to pay for an additional SQL license for SSRS in an Azure VM? Is it portable, the license? If not, most likely you might have to pay for it. Hmm. But that will be a separate entity. Unless you have a license, you, you are able to demonstrate that you actually just shut down your SQL Server reporting services. And I think you might have to pay for it as a full-blown SQL Server. And remember, one more thing I have to share. Uh, this might come as a rude shock for a lot of you, but <clears throat> whether your server on the cloud is 2008 or 2016, if you are having a group license, you will pay up everything for 2016 and not for 2008. So consider that also when you're moving. Fantastic, thank you. Um, a question here, when you talk about Azure and databases, does Azure mean SQL instance in Azure or do we talk about Azure database? What would you recommend where we talk about Azure? Azure database or Azure instance in Azure? So the classic answer that an IT guy gives is generally called depends, right? I mean, it's a very popular answer, right? So what I would say is that actually you really need to study what your cost would be for an Azure SQL database versus a VM. Uh, if it is a platform or an infrastructure as a service, right, you always have more control over that. Uh, whereas in the SQL, I mean the database as a service, if you're going to have database only, you really don't know if you have a noisy neighbor. Uh, you don't know how it is. Um, you really don't know what you're paying for. I would love to see that. I wish there was a clear cut answer. My preference is going for VM. If you have say 15 or 20 databases uh, as a part of your suite of applications, then I would say definitely have your own VM. If it is just one off kind of database, then use Azure SQL database. I hope that answers your question. And I will also share my contact information again, just in case somebody is actually looking for this. So, <clears throat> go ahead guys, any more questions? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. We have a question, is your 
DB has a lot of restrictions in terms of operational prospects. Should we consider moving our databases to Azure DB and should we prepare for that? So similar question like the previous one, right? But uh, as I said, you know, there are several restrictions. I would definitely, depending on what you are really looking for, it is, say for example, if it is um, a classic case of, you know, a small backend database to your website, which all it is doing is handling inputs from your web pages, then I would say, you know, just no matter what the restrictions are, just go ahead and use the Azure SQL database. But if it is going to be your constant OLTP kind of backend, <clears throat> I would say definitely go ahead and have your own VM there. Not even Azure SQL Server, but the VM and then you install your own SQL Server whereby you can actually port your own licenses across. And we have one last question. So uh, if anyone else has any other questions, we still have about four minutes for questions. So the last question I have here at the moment is, I am a developer. Should I be thinking about changing to the cloud? Oh, yes. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I cannot tell this enough number of times. Um, you, yes, you, everything you do now, you need to think in terms of cloud. How does this work in the cloud? Uh, that's, that's, I think you basically you would be future proof in your career because you really, you remember the first slide I told you, your CIO comes to the company and says, you know what, you're now going to Azure. And with who's twitching their thumbs? You are, okay? So you don't want to be caught doing that. So also once you think in terms of cloud, your horizontal or vertical movement in and out of the organization will go up big time. Your ability to move will become big time. So do not get happy with just one job that you have right now, because remember, if your company is not cloud, uh, you should embrace another company. If I hope that answers the gentleman or lady's question. Um, for certification, what is the best source for training for certification if I don't have any environments set up yet? So actually, Brilliant question. I wish I answered this earlier or made the presentation. So if you actually go to some of these Microsoft learn.doc, I mean, I did that Azure 100 training, uh, which was free by the way. And when I ran the training, it would actually help me create just a sandbox for me. It's a bare minimum sandbox, but it would give you enough power for you to monkey around your database servers. Definitely, excellent question. I'm sorry, I did not include that in my initial presentation, but going forward, I will. So the bottom line is, yes, you should go about doing it. Uh, if possible, try to get uh, a free account from Azure. Whatever $100 gets you, go ahead and use that. And if you have to pay a little bit in a month, I would say, please go ahead and do it anyways you can claim that as a part of your professional development expense as in your income tax returns too. So it's something that you did to improve your career for which your company did not reimburse. Uh, the other way of doing it is that generally if you are in Azure, then the company will have enough systems where they can actually make you part of that uh, test subscription and you can definitely go about monkeying there as much as you want. I gave you the example of Snowflake, for example. Snowflake gives you $400 worth of credit. You can go ahead and create a 2,000 node cluster in literally less than one minute and process like 600 million rows in two minutes, destroy the cluster, and you're happy as hell. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I, here's my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them either on Twitter or on my Gmail. I would love to answer and stay in touch. And if you are reaching out to me on LinkedIn, please do write a note as to you heard me over here. And if you are tweeting, they were an awesome guy he was. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Parish. If you have uh, another slide, I think there's one more slide after this. Um, thank and, you for attending. Yeah, thank, Yay. Yes. <laughs> and thank you, Parish, and everyone. Uh, 
for attending the session and thank mm. you uh, yeah, and to please, pass. Yeah, and don't forget to put in your evaluations. They really help us make each presentation better. And with each better presentation, each of these events get better. And they do listen and we do listen. So. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you, Hamish. And uh, I hope to see you either in Boston or in Christchurch one of these days. Absolutely. Thanks, Parish. Take care. Bye, guys. Have a lovely day. Bye.